Hey out there, I'm Jeff DeRiso and welcome to another edition of Mind Hack. Today, elite military units pursue brain stimulating technology, weapons that remotely control the human nervous system, and the impact of digital storytelling methods on our psychology. Before we begin today, I'd like to mention a new development here at NewsBud, and that is NewsBud Academy, which offers online courses to help you expand your knowledge base on the important issues that we cover. The first course, taught by Professor Philip Kovacevich, is Foundations of Anglo-American and Russian Geopolitics, which will give you a factual knowledge base when it comes to our relationship with Russia. Registration is now open, so reserve your spot today. Our first article for this week was published in Military.com on April 2nd, 2017 by Hope Hodge Sec. The title reads, Super Seals, Elite Units Pursue Brain Stimulating Technologies. At a recent military conference in Washington, D.C., Commander of Navy Special Operations Rear Admiral Tim Szymanski called on industry leaders to develop cognitive enhancement technology to further boost the performance of these elite soldiers. He spoke of his excitement about recent developments in cognitive enhancement technology, saying, in experiments, people who were watching these screens, their ability to concentrate would fall off in about 20 minutes. But they did studies whereby a little bit of electrical stimulation was applied, and they were able to maintain the same peak performance for 20 hours. The technology Szymanski is referring to is called transcranial electrical stimulation and has been tested by multiple Navy SEAL units as part of the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental Initiative, or DIUX. According to Naval Special Warfare Command spokesperson Captain Jason Salata, early tests on volunteer subjects have shown promising results, although Salata did not get into any specifics of these results. The company that developed one of these brain stimulation devices is called Halo Neuroscience. Halo Neuroscience has created a headset that resembles a pair of headphones, but actually works by a process they call neuropriming. According to the Halo Neuroscience website, neuropriming is a process that stimulates the brain to enter a state of hyperelasticity, which allows faster learning and improved focus, and can also lead to improved physical performance. The technology is currently being marketed as the Halo Sport headset for athletes. In a recent study conducted with the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association, ski jumpers observed a 13% gain in propulsion force and 11% gain in jump smoothness compared with the control group over four weeks of using the Halo Sport device. Brett Wingeyer, co-founder of Halo Neuroscience, says that this headset technology is currently being tested by SEAL teams to make their physically demanding training process more efficient. Transcranial electrical stimulation is just one of the many brain stimulation techniques being tested by special operations. Andrew Hare, CEO of the research firm Helicase, says that most useful performance aids are actually much lower tech, such as performance nutrition, supplements, caffeine, and even meditation. This device created by Halo Neuroscience reminded me of the recent development by Australian scientists called the Thinking Cap, which when tested on subjects was able to induce improved memory, better attention to detail, more creativity, better proofreading skills, and even better problem solving skills. Many would see this technology as an example of the military once again flexing its muscles by exploring developing technologies which many consider to be in the realms of science fiction. However, I think that there are positive results that can come from the use of a device like this. For example, I came across the video of a musician who said that the Halo Sport device increased his ability to learn and retain musical compositions on the piano. Now that this technology is available to the public, we have the opportunity to decide whether we want to use it or not and to what ends. Our next article for today was published in Global Research on April 13, 2017 by Mumir Babacek. It's entitled, 
electronic weapons, radio frequency radiation, remote manipulation of the human nervous system. This article is actually an open letter addressed to the European Commission, which demands legislation to ban technology that allows remote manipulation of the human nervous system. In March 2016, Polish Defense Minister Antoni Macierewicz was participating in a discussion at a university when he was asked by an audience member if he had a strategy to deal with illegal experiments with electromagnetic weapons on unwitting Polish citizens. His reply to the audience member was that he would soon be establishing a commission to investigate the use of these weapons, which Mumir Babacic sees as an admittance that these weapons exist and that they may be used on unsuspecting citizens. Six months later, a Polish weekly magazine followed up with the defense minister asking the results of his investigation. The defense minister replied that the commission had never been established because, quote, this topic is subjected to national security information connected with the defense of the nation. In the author's view, this is once again an admission that this program not only exists, but that it is being covered up and is classified by European governments. The author points to a 2000 document which says that NATO member states have accepted the American doctrine of non-lethal weapons, which includes, quote, systems which can directly interact with the human nervous system. The author Babacic then goes on to give us a brief overview of what these weapons are and how they work. As we know, the human body is made up mostly of water, and water contains charged particles which are called ions. Because water in the human body is full of these ions, he says that it is comparable to an electrolytic fluid, which is used to conduct electrical currents. The movement of these ions throughout the nerve fibers of the human body creates the electrical signals which allow the nervous system to function. A 2014 scientific study in China found that microwaves produce electronic currents in electrolytic fluids. The author goes on to state that the different signals that are sent and received in our nervous system are uniquely identified by their difference in frequency. In 1997, scientists at the University of Washington reported that EEG readings from animals became synchronized with the pulsing of microwaves transmitted into their brain. This finding allows for the potential that microwaves could pulse at a certain frequency and therefore cause a nervous system reaction in a human. As further studies have confirmed, this accounts for the false sensation we get when it feels like our cell phone is vibrating, but it actually is not. Ross A.D. conducted experiments in the 1980s using a 450 megahertz frequency pulsed at 16 hertz, which resulted in his human subjects having less ability to concentrate. The experiment was replicated many times with the same results. As early as 1962, Alan H. Frey managed to transmit sound perceptions into the human brain by using pulsed frequencies ranging from 425 to 1310 megahertz. These experiments were also replicated many times with the same results. Even more fascinating is a 1975 study by Don R. Justison, which proved that recognizable human speech could be perceived through this method. In his experiment, recordings of pronounced digits from 1 to 10 were transmitted into the human brain via pulsed microwaves. And the subject of the experiment could hear and recognize the digits. The author contends that these findings clearly reveal the potential for weapons to be created which can alter a person's behavior or severely damage their health. He also notes that a growing number of people worldwide are complaining of symptoms that fall into the category of electromagnetic radiation. But rather than being offered treatment, they are instead being sent to psychiatric hospitals and their claims are never investigated. Because it seems the Polish government has all but admitted that these weapons exist and that the details are classified, it seems plausible that corrupt government agencies may be using them to experiment on unsuspecting citizens. The author argues that there needs to be legislation in place which prevents the use of such weapons that can so easily be used by a group whose agenda is to subvert the rule of law. Police investigators cannot know to look for the signs of electromagnetic harassment 
unless there are laws in place which clearly define and prohibit it. Babachik's letter closes with a powerful final statement. It reads, We still hope that you will stick to the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, and democracy embedded in the Treaty on European Union and will work for the ban of the use of technologies which make it possible to deprive people of their personal freedom and freedom of thought, creating thus totalitarian regimes of a new type. One observation that I can offer about this letter is that it was clearly written by a person who has a high degree of optimism and faith in the goodness of other people. Many people who are considered more cynical or skeptical would say that Babacek is wasting his time writing a letter to a government who is evidently complicit in these crimes. However, optimists like Babacek might argue back that even if this letter affects one or ten or a hundred people, that it is worth the time it took for him to write it, even if it may not create the magnitude of change that he wishes for. And that makes a lot of sense too, because studies have shown that as people get older in life, they often regret the things that they did not do more than the things that they did do. I believe to some degree that certain people perceive a false dichotomy between cynicism and optimism, and that our attitude must fall into one of these categories. Both cynicism and optimism, when adopted completely and wholly, have their limits. It has been my experience that a more realistic approach to a healthy discourse with others is actually a balance between the two. After reading this article, I became very curious to find out if there were specific examples of this technology used to control people's minds. And that brings me to today's Mind Hack Flashback. Today we flash back to July 16, 1968, when the U.S. Patent Office awarded Patrick Flanagan with a patent for his invention, a nervous system excitation device, which he dubbed the Neurophone. Flanagan had invented the Neurophone 10 years earlier when he was only 14 years old. It had taken Flanagan six years to convince the Patent Office that the device worked and only when he demonstrated to them that it allowed a deaf employee at the patent office to hear music once again. Flanagan by this time worked as a consultant for Tufts University and the Office of Naval Research, researching dolphin communication with Dr. Dwight Wayne Bateau. This dolphin communication research led to the development of an updated digital neurophone which transmitted human speech into ultrasonic signals. An improvement to the patent filed later that year on August 29, 1968, was marked classified by the U.S. government for national security reasons and was not released until another four years later in 1972. Flanagan went on to invent many other things and claims to have been a consultant for the NSA, the CIA, and NASA. He is now billed as a New Age author who has written several books about pyramid power. I find this remote transmission of the human voice technology to be very interesting, especially when considering events in the recent news where suspected terrorists or killers claim that they heard voices telling them to carry out these crimes. Most of the media outlets who report on these events equate this hearing of voices automatically with mental illness, which shows that they are either blind to the fact that this technology exists, or they are unwilling to admit the possibility that criminals could use it for malicious purposes. And that is today's Mind Hack Flashback. Our final article for today is published in Skyward on April 17, 2017, by Nicola Brown. The title says, How Our Digital Storytelling Methods Are Psychologically Affecting Our Audiences. Brown opens the article by saying, As I write this, there's a tab open in my browser that's been sitting there for a week. This is something that everyone who remembers a time before the internet can relate to. The amount of options now at our fingertips has noticeably affected our attention spans. When we get on the internet, we may have one purpose in mind, but a few hyperlinks later, we can easily get far from where we intended. The reason for this, Brown says, is that, quote, our digital content landscape is psychologically impacting our audiences 
more than ever before. Today, many of us have multiple internet connected devices in our homes. And we can often be caught multitasking on two different devices simultaneously. For example, watching Netflix while browsing Twitter, or listening to a podcast while texting your friend. Researchers at the University of Helsinki recently studied the connection between media multitasking and distractibility among 13 to 24 year olds. They found that those who reported more of a tendency to engage with multiple media types simultaneously had problems with attention related tasks. According to the study, this happens because multitasking creates competition for neural resources in the brain. As a result, there are roughly only 50% of the resources that would normally be available to complete the task. In other words, says Brown, we end up performing poorly on everything. We'd be better off focusing on a single activity at a time. Brown also points to a 2016 study published in a psychology journal that found media multitasking is associated with symptoms of depression and social anxiety. She also brings up the topic of binge watching, which we discussed in the previous episode of MindHack. A recent study by the International Communication Association found that 18 to 29 year olds who reported feelings of loneliness and depression were more likely to binge watch content. The findings of another study by the University of Cologne in Germany suggested that people may be having a hard time balancing short-term benefits of media consumption versus the fulfillment gained by long-term planning. In order to reach an increasingly divided and distracted audience, Brown says that digital content creators of all kinds have become exponentially more sensationalist in telling their stories. She argues that this constant sensationalism traumatizes us and further contributes to social anxiety. She concludes the article by saying that we should not be content to simply grab the eyeballs of our audiences, but instead to reflect on how our content is changing the way our audiences think and behave for better or worse. For instance, I am a digital content creator for Newsbud, and of course, I want people to consume my content. But what I don't want to do is create an audience of couch potatoes who never translate their knowledge into action. I want to create a healthy feedback loop between us where there is a balance between gathering information and knowledge and applying it in our communities and in the world by taking action. Nicola Brown believes that humanity will slowly shift back to having a more healthy relationship with media content and that it will be more focused on long-term growth than short-term reward. All of us at Newsbud want to be at the forefront of that shift, and that is why we always strive to place a higher priority on reporting accurately than on grabbing your attention. Our intent is never to take advantage of people who feel lonely and depressed and profit by creating a negative feedback loop, like some media companies out there. And I think the recent development of the Newsbud Academy is a great example of Newsbud's commitment to the long-term growth of their audience as human beings. That's it for today's edition of MindHack. Please share this video with your friends and consider becoming a member of the Newsbud community. I'm Jeff DeRiso and I'll see you next time. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the Newsbud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from Newsbud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from Newsbud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at newsbud.com.